But truly, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for tuning in, proclaiming God's word with prophetess Patricia J. Williams. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Spirit of the living God, I thank you and I praise you. And I give you the glory for all that you've done and all that you are about to do. Father God, I decrease in order that you may increase within me. Father God, I ask that you will heal, deliver, and set the captive free. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. And if you have your Bibles on this morning, could you please turn them to the book of Psalm, 126 division. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3. That's the book of Psalm, 126 division, 1 through 3. And it says, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord have done great things for them. The Lord have done great things for us, whereof we are glad. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his most holy word. And we, the topic of today is, we are in a great divine turnaround. We are in a great divine turnaround. In other words, this is your season of divine turnaround. That which God has said unto you, the captivity that you were in, the spirit of the Lord saying you are in your season of a divine turnaround. So let us look at the keys of a divine turnaround. But first of all, what is a turnaround? A turnaround is a development or change that results in favorable or beneficial outcome. A divine turnaround is when God steps in specifically to reverse the circumstances abruptly, mm -hmm. turning it into a positive experience that is beyond human control or human nature. Amen. The three examples of a divine turnaround is, first of all, I would like to remind you of three people, three people who were precarious, and who was in some dire situations, okay? And who God turned around their circumstances, okay? Number one is Exodus, in the book of Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 31. The children at the Red Sea were about to perish or to be captured, but God gave them a turnaround. Come on here. The sea was used as a pathway to their destiny. It was sudden. It was like a dream. He split at the Red Sea so they can walk through. I declare to you on this morning, your desires of sudden intervention receive a turnaround right now in the name of Jesus. Number two, in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, the 6th and the seven verses, chapter 2 and the first verse, Hannah was a woman of sorrow. Her rival, which was Paniah, made her miserable. Yes, she did. But when God stepped into her situation, a barren woman, the mother of six children, she became a mother of six children. Yes, she did. This was a divine turnaround. Things overwhelming joy that is beyond description. And the third one, because I told you it was three examples. The third one is come from the book of Luke, 
chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Peter and his friends were professional fishermen. They knew when to fish, morning time was not the best time to fish. The fish, the fish could see them and run. The glare will not allow them to see the fish. So they knew better than Jesus in the natural when it came to fishing. So in other words, they was like, okay, we know not the fish in the day because the fish can see us. But here Jesus was finna gather the fish in, in the day. So Jesus was instructing them here to fish in the morning after they had toiled all night. And which, remember, the nighttime to them was the best time to fish. But anyway, they obeyed reluctantly and halfway as Jesus told Peter to cast his nets. But he only cast a net. Remember, Jesus told him for to cast his nets, more than one net. But he just did one. But they were astonished. Yes, they was. They caught net breaking, boat sinking fish that day. Divine turnaround defies science. It defies all laws. Yes, it does. In the name of Jesus, may you experience a net breaking turnaround this month. In Jesus' name. So we're going to move further along. There are six keys to divine turnaround. Number one, trust in God. Mark 9 and 23. Mark 10 and 27. Have faith that only God can turn your situation around. You must have a violent faith to provoke a turnaround in your life situation. Violent faith is aggressive, persistent, like a bulldog. It seizes with a grip and does not let go. Reference, Mark 5, 25 through 34, Mark 10, 47 through 48. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he yelled louder, despite the world telling him to be quiet. Faith will help you to decide what you are dissatisfied with your current situation and to move forward. Second Kings 7 chapter 3 through 7. 1 Samuel 1 and 9. If you let it go, it's gone, people of God. No man who trusts in God is not passively waiting. He moves. The man who trusts God does not listen to no from the doctors. Employers. Economic situations. Every situation is an opportunity to trust God. The widow and Bartimaeus were both tired of their situations. Yes, they was. Both applied nonstop, constant, continual, steady, relentless pressure on their covenant and on the devil. They did not let go. You must be desperate. Come on here, somebody, for a turnaround. You must be sick and tired of being sick and tired. You must say, God, I give up. Whatever you want me to do, I do it. Whatever you want me to say, I say it. I'm sick or tired. I'm sick and tired of going through this situation because it looks like it's never going to change. People of God, I declare over you today, 
who is desperate for the touch and a move of God to receive your turnaround in the name of Jesus. Number two, total and complete obedience to divine instructions. Second Kings 5 and 14. Luke 5 and 5. John 2 and 5. To have a divine turnaround in a situation, you must obey the Lord at all costs. The Lord will always give specific instructions that will lead to your breakthrough. The instruction may not make sense. Obey anyway. Avoid partial obedience, like King Saul in 1 Samuel 15 and 2 and 3, 7 through 11 and verse 22. When God, through the prophet Samuel, instructed him to kill the enemy nation, and he kept some. You see, God gave him specific instruction on what to do. Saul being greedy. He gave a little, but then he kept some of it. And by him being disobedient and keeping some of it, he lost his throne at that same time. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take you total and complete obedience to divine instructions. You can't do it your way. You can't do it halfway. You, you have to have to do it all the way or none at all. Number three, word-based prayer. Second Chronicles 20, 1 through 10. Isaiah 38, 1 through 3. Prayer is agreeing with God on his covenant. Prayer is actually talking to God. Your prayer must be faith and word-based. Has God done it before? Yes, he has. Pray the word back to God. Just like God say, remind him of his word. Remind him of what he said. Hallelujah. Will he do it again? Yes, he will. Be specific in your prayer, and you will see that he is too faithful not to fail you. Four, engage your tongue. Mark 11, 23, and 24. People of God, you must speak only what the Lord has spoken. Deceased from speaking the problem, speak the word of God. The devil can only obey the command of the word and name of Jesus. And the Lord honors his words. Psalm 138 and 2, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. Find scriptures that speak to your issue and speak them. Put the word in your heart. Hide your word in my heart. That's a song. So put the word in your heart and it will come out of your mouth in the time of need. Declare the word with authority. Ecclesiastes 8 and 4 says that the word of a king is powerful. Yes, it is. And Revelation 1 and 6 calls you a king. Come on here. You have authority. Use it. Number five, stay away from habitual sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 13, and Isaiah 59, 1 through 3. People of God, sin is a burial, a barrier to reach, to reaching God. Hosea 71, Joseph witnessed a turnaround because he refused to sin against God. Genesis 39 and 9, confess and turn away from sin immediately. Number six. 
have a lifestyle of praise. Mm -hmm. Second Corinth, Second Chronicles, I'm sorry, 20 and 18 through 22. David enjoyed several turnarounds in his life. He was a man of praise. Praise is an altar for divine turnaround. Praise brings God into a devastating situation. That's why it's very important for the praise team, if one have a praise team, or for the choir, or for a song, to have the right songs to usher in the spirit of the Lord so God can move the way he needs to move. Words are very important. The words of a song can destroy the yokes of the enemy off a person's life, out of their situation, out of anything they're going through. That's why it is very important for a choir or a praise team to pray and if and not Thank you, Holy Ghost. And not if you can, but when you can, to fast, to get, you have to be on one accord. Mm. You have to move according to the spirit of the living God. Because number one, once the atmosphere is set, it gives the Holy Spirit and the spirit of the Lord free course to move in the building or in your life. Because like the Holy Ghost say, it destroys you. A song will back the enemy up. When praises, there is a thing that says, when praises go up, blessings come down. So you have to hear the spirit of the Lord on what to sing so he can come in and destroy yokes. He can come in and heal sin sick bodies. He can come in and he can deliver. He can come in and do what needs to be done. Most people do not want the spirit of the Lord to move. Why? Because they no longer have control. Come on here, somebody. It's tight, but it's right. Some leaders don't want the spirit of the Lord to move in their services because they want to keep the people bound. Come on here. Because whom the son make free is free indeed. And once you get a touch of a move of God, I, uh, I'm a living witness. Or you experience the presence of God, you will no longer be the same. Your eyes will become open spiritually. Your ears will become open spiritually. And it's not saying you don't need your leader because, yes, you need someone to be accountable for you. That's why God sent pastors after his own heart to lead you, shepherds to lead you and guide you. But the point is you are no longer dependent on your pastor. You are dependent on your on God. He is only there to lead and guide you. He's not your God. God placed him there for a reason or placed her there for a reason. Not to be your God. It is important to have a lifestyle of praise. Not only when you're going through, because when trouble hits you, oh my God, it won't shake you. It may touch you, but it won't shake you because you have a lifestyle of praise. Not only praise, but worship. Because worship means God, I don't care if I don't have a dime in my pocket. Or God, I don't care if I'm homeless. I'm still going to praise you. I'm still going to lift you up. I'm still going to give you the glory. Because I know this is only a test of my faith. This, this is, ah, I'm still going to praise you because I know you in the midst of this. Come on here, somebody. Hmm. Having a lifestyle of praise is not hard. Huh? You got a little shot because if you only think of the things that God has done for you before, 
You wouldn't have, you you wouldn't have people to pump and prime you to praise God because you already have a praise down on the inside of you. When you wake up in the morning, you should have a praise. When you lay down at night, you should have a praise. Even when things in the middle of your day come up against you or get next to you, you should always have a praise. Hmm. A lifestyle of praise. Just like the word of God say, David enjoyed several turnarounds in his life because he was a man of praise. David was a man after God's own heart. Even with his mistakes. He wasn't the best person, but he messed up. But even in the midst of his mess, he still was a man after God's own heart. Even in the midst of your mess, you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Come on here now. Sometimes we get beside ourselves and think that we don't go through nothing or we don't feel nothing. Some of us, we all error. Come on here, somebody. But the thing of it is, we don't stay down. We go fall, but we don't stay there. We pick ourselves up, we dust ourselves off, and we go head on. And we think about that turnaround. When I was in the midst, when I was there in the fork road, didn't know which way to turn, wanted to go to a world of sin because the church people treated me so bad. Huh, y'all are the elbow shot. But in the midst of my fork in the road, I was stuck in a hard place, but God did a divine turnaround in my life. And I don't know who the Holy Ghost is speaking to on this morning, but I hear the Spirit of the Lord say, look for your divine turnaround within the next seven days. You're not going to stay in this situation. You're not going to stay addicted. You're not going to stay in a loss. You are a winner. You're going to win. We serve a mighty God. We serve a winning God. We serve a victorious God. How y'all are both, Shonda. And in the name of Jesus, within seven days, your divine turnaround has came. It's time to come up out of the stagnated position. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Let your praise be so high during fierce opposition that it shows that you trust God to help you. When you call on the name of Jesus, that's letting him know you ain't you can't do this by yourself. that you need the help of God. Philippians 4 and 13 say, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can't do nothing by myself. I can't even wake up by myself. I cannot even lay down by myself. I can't even go during my day by myself. But with Christ, I can do all things. I can do everything that my heart desires to do with him. You cannot live this life without him. You cannot pick him up and put him down whenever you feel like it. That crack pipe is not your God. Mojo is not your God. Jack Daniels is not your God. Yes, that is your temporarily Fixed to ease the pain or ease the grief that you're going through. But if you want the pain to re be removed, if you want your situation to change, I beg you on this morning to give your life to Christ. People of God, I wasn't saved my whole life. I sinned, I fornicated, and I smoked, I drank, I did everything. But when I got sick and tired of being sick and tired and realizing 
that every time I will put that bottle up to my mouth or put that cigarette up to my mouth, that it was just easing the pain for a moment. But when I gave my life to Christ, he took away the pain. He took away the addiction. That void was filled with him and with only him. And let me tell you something. You ain't too saved and you ain't too holy that the enemy do not come and tempt you again with the stuff that God has delivered you from. That's the problem with some people today. They think they got it all together. You may have it all together. I applaud you, but every day, I'm talking about myself because I'm transparent. I have to pray. Mm -hmm. I have to pray because those were strongholds, generational curses from my background, my lineage that had held me captive as well. And when God has called you out from your family to be a Joseph, to pray, to break them generational curses, when you have been through some stuff, some molestation, some beatings that you know it wasn't beatings of correction, but of hate. Come on here, somebody. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to speak to the ones that really want something from God. The only way you're going to live a free life and total freedom is giving your life over to Christ. That's where your turnaround begin. Because I tell them all the time, the benefits of living for Christ is awesome. I love it. You see, I was raised in church, but the church wasn't in me. I sang everything else. But when it come a time when you really got to know Jesus, that's when your whole world opens up. So, will you allow your praise to come forth? It's telling God that I trust you. Well, I ask that you will have a blessed day on today. And if you need to write me, go to my website, www.patriciajwilliams.com. Remember, I love you and God does too. Have a blessed day. Uh.